Welcome to the Folktale Project. This is Dan Schultz. And we're back. It's been a long few weeks. And I've missed you. And I've missed bringing you these tales. And I, I hope that you've missed me too. But I also hope that you've taken the time to catch up with Legends of the Rhine. If you haven't, head back to last week's episode where I've read through all of the stories that we've gone through in Wilhelm Ruland's Legends of the Rhine thus far. Because this week, we're going to dive right back in. This story is a two-part tale and tells us about two brothers, two very different Brothers. This is The Brothers. In the Middle Ages, an old knight belonging to the court of the Emperor Conrad II lived in a castle called Sternberg near Bopard. The old warrior had two sons left to him. His wife had died many years before, and since her death, Merry laughter had seldom been heard in the halls of the beautiful castle. Soon, a ray of sunshine seemed to break into those solemn rooms. A distant cousin at Rudesheim had died, leaving his only child, a beautiful young girl, to the care of his relative. The golden-haired Angela became the pet of the castle, and won the affection and friendship of the two sons by her engaging ways. What had already happened hundreds of times now happened among these young people. Love replaced the friendship of the two young knights, and both tried to win the maiden's favor. The old master of the castle noticed this change, and his father's heart forebode trouble. Both sons were equally dear to him, but perhaps his firstborn, who had inherited his mother's gentle character, fulfilled his heart's desire more than the fiery spirit of Conrad the Younger. From the first moment when the orphan appeared at his family seat, he had conceived the thought that his favorite son, Henry, who was heir to his name and estates, would marry the maiden. Henry loved Angela with a profound, sincere feeling which he seldom expressed. His brother, on the contrary, made no secret of his ardent love, and soon the old man perceived with sorrow that the beautiful girl returned his younger son's passionate love. Henry, too, was not unaware of the happiness of this pair, and in generous self-denial he tried to bury his grief, and to rejoice heartily in his brother's success. The distress of the elder brother did not escape Angela. She was much moved when she first remarked that his voice trembled on pronouncing her name, but soon love dazzled her eyes, so that the clouds on his troubled countenance passed unnoticed by her. About this time, St. Bernard of Clairvaux came from France to the Rhine, preaching a second crusade against the infidels. The fiery words of the saintly monk roused many thousands to action. His appeal likewise reached the castle of Sternberg. Henry, though not envying his brother's happiness, felt that it would be impossible for him to be a constant witness of it, and thus he was glad to answer this call and to take up the cross. Conrad, too, longing for action and dominated by the impulse of the moment, was stirred up by the witching charms which a crusade to Palestine offered. His adventurous soul, cramped up in the castle so far removed from the world, thirsted for the adventures which he imagined were awaiting the crusaders in the far-off east. In vain the tears and prayers of the young girl were shed, in vain was the sorrow of his father who begged him not to desert him. The old man was in despair about the unbending resolutions of his sons. Who will remain at the castle of my forefathers if you both abandon it now, perhaps never to return? cried he sorrowfully. I implore you, my eldest son, you— the very image of your mother, to have pity on your father's gray hairs. And you, Conrad, have pity on the tears of your betrothed. The brothers remained silent. Then the eldest grasped the old man's hand, saying gently, I shall not leave you, father. And you, Angela, said the younger to the weeping maiden, you will try and bear this separation, and will plant a sprig of laurel to make a wreath for me when I return. 
The next day, the young knight left the home of his forefathers. At first, the maiden seemed inconsolable in her grief, but soon her love began to slumber like a tired child. On awakening from this drowsiness, indignation seized her, whispering complainingly in her ear and disturbing all the sweet memories in which the picture of her light-hearted lover gleamed forth, he who had parted from her for the sake of empty glory. Now left to herself, she began to consider the proud youth who was forced to live under the same roof with his rejected love. She admired his good qualities, which all seemed to have escaped her before, his great daring at the chase, his skill with weapons, and his many kind acts of pure friendship to her, with the view of sweetening the bitter separation from which she was suffering. He seemed afraid of rousing the love which was still sleeping in his heart. In the meantime, Angela felt herself drawn more and more towards the knight. She wished to try and make him understand that her love for his younger brother had only been a youthful passion which seemed to have flown when he left her. She felt unhappy when she understood that Henry, whom she now began really to love, seemed to feel nothing but brotherly affection for her, and she longed in her inmost soul for a word of love from him. Henry was not unaware of this change in her affections, but he proudly smothered every rising thought in his heart for his brother's betrothed. The old knight was greatly pleased when one day Angela came to him and with tears in her eyes disclosed to him the secret of her heart. He prayed God fervently to bring these two loving hearts together whom he believed were destined to one another by the will of God. In his dreams, he already saw Angela in her castle like his dead wife and his first-born son rocking her little baby, a blue-eyed, fair-haired child. Then he would suddenly recollect his impetuous younger son fighting in the crusades and his dreams would be hastily interrupted. Just opposite to his ancestral hall he caused a proud fort to be built, and called it Liebenstein, intending it for his second son when he returned from the Holy Land. This castle was hardly finished when the old man died. The crusade was at last at an end. All the knights from the Rhine country brought back the news with them on their return from the Holy Land that Conrad had married a beautiful Grecian woman in the east and was now on his way home with her. Henry was beside himself with wrath on hearing this news. Such dishonorable conduct and shameful neglect seemed impossible to him and going to the maiden, he informed her of his brother's approaching return. She turned very pale, her lips moved, but her tongue found no words. And that is part one of The Brothers, a tale of two brothers and a shared love. On Wednesday, we'll get part two, and, well... It doesn't turn out quite so great for anyone, if we're going to be honest. But at this point, we kind of expect that, don't we? This is Dan Schultz from The Folktale Project. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Overcast, anywhere you like to get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Folktale Project. You can find us on Auto Radio, TuneIn Radio, iHeart Radio, Spotify, anywhere you like to listen. And you can always head over to folktaleproject.com where you'll find a new story waiting for you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And if you enjoy the podcast, please head over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen and leave a rating and a review. And you can also always head over to folktaleproject.com support if you'd like to buy the podcast a coffee or become a Patreon patron. As always... Thank you so much for listening.